From Diamond Pharmacy Services, this is Podcast Rx, a monthly show that takes you behind the counter of the nation's largest correctional pharmacy provider. We bring you conversations with pharmacists, nurses, managers, and other Diamond staff about the topics and issues we see in corrections, long-term care, and community health settings. Our chats aren't limited to purely pharmacy topics, and they aren't strictly clinical either. So if you're a healthcare provider or just enjoy healthcare podcasts, we think you'll enjoy this show. On this episode, RN consultant and nurse practitioner Debbie Yakabowski returns for a quick discussion of influenza. We explore the expected severity of the upcoming flu season, review the available vaccines, dive into vaccine hesitancy, and discuss the ultimate protections afforded by an annual flu shot. I'm Adam Campbell, and welcome to Podcast Rx. Well, hello, Debbie. It's always great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. How have you been in the year or so since we last saw each other? Well, thanks for asking, Adam. Um, It's been a busy year, obviously. We are still in doing COVID and dealing with COVID as well as now we're into flu season for 2022-2023. So what I've primarily been doing over the last year are a lot of COVID vaccine clinics for our customer base, getting in there and getting first, second shots, first boosters, second boosters, as well as now we're into the bivalent booster and we're into flu season. So I've been busy doing flu vaccine clinics as well. No doubt you have been busy. Uh, regular listeners to the show know that you are the infection control coordinator for for here at Diamond and a, an RN consultant with facilities, long-term care facilities. Um, and what they may not have known, but you already spoke to, is that you do coordinate vaccine clinics for employees and for sites, uh, particularly fluenza, for influenza, but of course, as you just said, for uh, COVID boosters as well. And uh, flu season in particular was something I wanted to talk to you about today, because no matter what news you read, you're going to see some stories, many reports saying what a rough flu season that we're in for. And so I wanted to have you on to get your thoughts on the outlook for flu season. And in addition to that, go over flu vaccines and other associated issues. So my first question then, Debbie, is how strongly do you agree with those press reports? Just how bad of a flu season do you think we're in for? I think we are going to have a bad flu season for a variety of reasons. And um, I think that coupled with the fact that we are still doing COVID and dealing with that. And even now, what's in the news recently is RSV for pediatric patients. So they're calling it kind of like the triple whammy because Mm -hmm. of the fact that we've got so much going on out there. And we still are not seeing uh, enough people out there getting vaccinated. Uh, They may have gotten first, those who may have gotten first and second doses of COVID have not gotten out and got boosters. Those who might have gotten first boosters have not gotten out and got second boosters. Those who have gotten first and second have not gotten out and got bivalent boosters. Flu vaccines are... People, for whatever reason, which we'll discuss later, they're not jumping on the bandwagon to get the flu vaccines as well. But they are saying that if you have had a flu vaccine, that should give you a little bit of added protection towards COVID as well. So I think just given the fact that we do have so much going on out there and the fact that we have been so isolated for so long, and now that we're trying to get back into a regular routine and we see more people out and about, it's going to be bad. Yeah, and that and that is what my next question was, is why is it exactly worse than previous years? And I, is it just not living in the COVID bubble anymore? You know, loosen restrictions, we don't have the mask mandates. And in other words, just normalcy pri- prior to uh, March of 2020. Is it really just boiled down to that or is there more to it? Uh, it pretty much boils down to that, Adam. It is going to be worse in comparison to when people were still isolating and we're not going anywhere. You know, we are mm-hmm. we are not isolating like we did in 2020 and we are getting about with our normal lives again. In the last few years, we haven't seen the flu activity like we had previously because of the isolation and because of what we had in place from an infection control standpoint. 
So we didn't have that opportunity to, to experience flu and to build up some immunity to flu. So those who have been isolated the last few years, uh, as we're getting out there and back into normal routines and being introduced to the flu viruses that are out there, we don't have that immunity. So we don't have that little extra fight in our own bodies internally to take care of, you know, dealing with the flu. So I, I think that also for some degree, the things that we did have in place in 2020, such as the mask masking, such as the physical distancing, such as the increased hand hygiene, we're not seeing it as much. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing it as much and people are not practicing those kinds of activities as much anymore. So that plays into it as well. And um, we just have not been exposed to the flu. And as far as the vaccines are concerned, like I had just mentioned a few minutes ago, people are not going and seeking vaccines. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not really anything new. I mean, we've seen people not want to get flu vaccines in the past. We've right. been dealing with the controversy with COVID vaccines over mm -hmm. the last few years. So it's not anything that we were not accustomed to seeing. And, you know, all of these factors are just playing into the fact that we are going to see uh, a, a bad time this year with it. Yeah. B basically, everybody's immune system's in for a shock. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because we just, yep. we, you know, we haven't built up that immunity. We'll talk more about vaccine and vaccine hesitancy um, a little later, but Right now, just about the flu virus itself, um, what are the strains that we're dealing with this season and how likely are they to cause severe disease in light of everything? Let me talk about the two strains that are the, the most predominant as far as what, of uh, simplifying the best that I can. Mm -hmm. There are usually two strains that we are dealing with. There's usually a type A virus that we're usually dealing with, and we're usually dealing with at least one type B um, virus as well. But right now, what we're dealing with, according to the CDC, I just looked on the website here yesterday, and according to the CDC for current data, we are dealing with two predominant type A strains, and those are always your more severe types of viruses, and they are the ones that are going to cause your most severe symptoms. So what we're dealing with is type H3N2 and we're dealing also with H1N1. Now, these are the same ones that we dealt with last year, mm -hmm. and we've seen H1N1 in the past as right. well. So this is not new to us, and mm -hmm. because of the fact that this is not new to, to us, these are the ones that are usually contained also in the flu vaccines that are available out there. About 75% of the confirmed cases right now out that have been reported to the CDC are type A virus strains. So like I said, those are your more severe. Mm -hmm. About 25% are your type B strains that we're seeing right now. So both strains are found, uh, like I said, the H1N1 and the H3N2, both of those type A's are found in all of the flu vaccines that are available out there right now, whether it be your egg-based, your cell-based, or your recombinant uh, therapy-based, they are all found in the vaccines at this point in time. And that's a perfect lead into my next question, which was if you could walk us through the currently available flu vaccines and the general similarities and differences between them, you just named a few types. Sure. Right now what's available in the United States, we have five different types that are available. The first is your standard dose flu vaccine without an adjuvant. And what an adjuvant is, is it's su a substance which actually enhances the body's natural immune response to the flu virus. And so we have the standard dose flu without the adjuvant. These are viral grown and they're grown in eggs. So somebody who is allergic to eggs, somebody who's allergic to chickens, usually cannot take this type of vaccine. It is approved for anybody who is age six months and older. 
and it is administered intramuscularly. The next one that we have is the cell-based standard dose without an adjuvant, and this is one that is grown in a cell culture. So we're not dealing with eggs, we're not mm -hmm. dealing with chickens. Somebody who has sensitivities or allergies to eggs or chickens can have this one administered. It also is approved for age six months and older, and it also is given intramuscularly. We have an inactivated flu vaccine, and this is actually also egg-based. It is recommended. This one is actually recommended for adults 65 years and older. It is given intramuscularly. And why this is recommended for adults 65 years and older is because it actually is four times stronger. It has four times the antigen in it compared with the standard vaccine. And that's what's recommended higher, we call them higher dose vaccines for individuals who are 65 and older because research has just shown that in order to achieve a high level of immunity, they need these stronger vaccines. And uh, like I said, these are egg-based vaccines. The fourth is based upon recumbent technology, and it's the recumbent flu vac vaccine. It's based more upon cell um, synthesis, and it's approved for 18 years of age and older. It also is given intramuscularly, and it is another one that's preferred for adults who are age 65 years and older as well because it has three times the antigen compared with a standard dose. So it is another one that you can use with individuals 65 and older. There is a nasal spray out. It's the live attenuated nasal spray. It's a weakened live flu virus. It's indicated for individuals two to 49 years of age, and it is not recommended for use in pregnant women or in individuals with certain medical conditions. So we do have a lot of avail availability of flu vaccines out there for individuals, irregardless of whether they have sensitivities or not. Um, I understand that the CDC published some new guidance for vaccines, particularly those available to seniors 65 and older, and you may have already completely covered this, but um, I just wanted to follow up on that about these um, new, new guidance for seniors and, and flu vaccines. Sure. Not that I'm touting any particular manufacturer mm -hmm. over another, but there are three vaccines that are available to individuals 65 and older right now. One is the flu zone high dose quadrivalent like I said, this contains four times the antigen as the standard dose does. So that is available and it is given intramuscularly. You have the flu block quadrivalent recumbent flu vaccine. Again, that's based upon recumbent technology, meaning that it doesn't use eggs to grow in, nor does it use chicken. So that is a, is a good one for individuals who have those types of sensitivities. And then there is the fluent or fluad quadrivalent adjuvanated flu vaccine. This is an egg-based one, and it includes what we talked about earlier, that adjuvant, which helps, to, helps the body's own natural immune system to build natural immune, to build a stronger immunity to the flu uh, viruses that are out there. Now, I wanted to switch into um, talking about the vaccines themselves, or I should say behaviors surrounding the vaccines. So we have all these great tools at our disposal to protect against influenza. Uh, you very neatly detailed them all, but yet there's, you know, there's not always the uptake that you would like to see in, in public health settings. And I wanted to ask first, Debbie, do you think that the controversy surrounding COVID vaccines, because we've heard so much about COVID vaccines and the political element and all that. Do you think that that's going to have an effect on the number of people getting a flu shot this season? I did see the term vaccine fatigue in a recent article kind of describing this phenomenon. And, you know, it has really been nothing but vaccine talk for the last two pandemic mm -hmm. years we've been living through. So given that the flu vaccine has been around long before 2020, do you think that, that any of that COVID stuff is going to spill over? I think so. Um, I think you, 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 
you kind of hit the nail on the head, Adam, with the fact that we do have a lot of vaccine hesitancy and um, you know, people are just tired of, of what we've been dealing with since the beginning of 2020 with COVID and now with flu vaccines. And there continues to be that hesitancy because we're we're getting so many mixed messages. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we get mixed messages from the media. We may get mixed messages from our friends from social media oh, yeah. as well. Uh, and people are tired of all those mixed messages, which may include erroneous messaging or false messaging. And they don't know what to believe anymore at this point in time. It's so divisive as far as the decision is. Uh, to get to not to get. And sometimes I think not only does it go along that line, but there's so many, so much political divisiveness out sure. there. So I think folks are following what their own particular parties are touting and what their own particular parties are feeling about COVID versus is it a hoax? Is it not a hoax? Should mm -hmm. I get the vaccine? Should I not get the vaccine? So we're, st we're going to continue to have that even into flu vaccines as well. So we've got the hesitancy as well as we've got that f fatigue going on. And I think just historically looking at the numbers that we've had, people don't, we don't normally see the high numbers historically of individuals getting flu vaccines as well. And um, it's, it's, it's an ongoing effort from year to year with mm -hmm. trying to get individuals to get flu vaccines. It's the easiest and probably one of the most cost-effective ways to prevent the flu. But for whatever reason, we still see folks who are just not wanting to get that vaccine. Right. And I... Uh... You answered a question I had for you, which was prior to COVID, were people getting the flu vaccine at adequate numbers or at least numbers that would please public health officials? And as you said, the, that you weren't seeing the high numbers you'd like to see. No. Um, I mean, we had um, some initiatives going on by the World Health Organization where they were hoping to get high numbers of of individuals, you know, they had goals in place and they were hoping to get individuals like 90% of the population back in 2020 to be vaccinated. We never have reached that. Uh, and we've been trying to increase numbers here at Diamonds with our own workforce. And I calculate the numbers each year, and of course, we, we make the vaccine available, and we do a lot of um, campaigns out there in mm -hmm. order to get the vaccine numbers to go up, but we, we never have ever seen anything close to the 90%, nor has it been seen in the general public that mm -hmm. the World Health Organization has, has wanted to see. I thought this was interesting that there was a survey I found from the National Foundation for Infectious Disease. It was done earlier this year. It found while 69% of U.S. adults agreed that flu vaccination is the best way to prevent flu-related hospitalizations and death, that only 49% plan to actually get vaccinated. And they broke this down a little more. 65% of adults age 65 and older plan to get vaccinated, but only 45% of those uh, 18 to 64 plan to get a, a flu vaccine. So very very similar numbers there in, in who wants to get it and who doesn't. Um, just strictly from your experience overall through 30-plus um, years in medicine, how, you know, do people overall just take flu vaccination seriously from year to year? I think you, you had mentioned the fact that we're seeing seniors. Uh, their numbers are obviously the highest, and seniors do take that very seriously. But I think the younger you are, you're seeing the numbers drop. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, obviously, middle age is going to be a little higher than, you know, Gen X groups or, I mean, your baby boomers are going to be higher, obviously. And then as we go to younger and younger age groups, we're not seeing as much of that occurring. And uh, intellectually, I think people know they need to get that vaccine, that that is the best way to protect themselves. 
but there's so many other factors that come into it. Um, you know, we talked about some of those. It's an emotional decision. Yeah. I, I think emotions come into it rather than intellect. And when you, you throw the emotions into it or when you throw social media into it or you throw the general media into it, um, that influences the decision-making process. And, you know, when you throw in the vaccine hesitancy and just the fatigue that we just talked about, that influences it as well. So, and historically, if you look at how many years in the past the vaccine has not been what they thought it should be, nor did it cover what they thought it should cover, I think people just think over time that why bother to get it? Because mm. last year it didn't cover the strains that were out there. So why should I get it? Yeah. So I, I, I think the older you are, the more in tune you are to get the vaccine. The younger you are, the less in tune you are to get the vaccine. Yeah. And just some other numbers from that survey. Um, the top reasons for not getting the vaccine among those surveyed, and I'll link to this survey in the show notes, uh, 41% do not think flu vaccines work very well. 39% cons are they're concerned about potential side effects from the vaccine. 28% said they never get the flu. 24% are concerned that it's, it, that you're about getting the flu itself from the vaccine. And 20% do not think flu is a serious illness. And as somebody who's administered a lot of flu vaccines in their career, what are some of the more mundane or even maybe outlandish reasons you've heard from people as to why they don't get their flu shot? And or what do they believe to be true about flu that isn't? How, how do you meet and ultimately conquer these misconceptions? Uh, it's it's an ongoing process. I do a survey monkey at the end of each flu vaccine administration season. Usually sometime in March, I will send a survey monkey survey out uh, checking to see what kind of numbers we have of individuals who did get the flu vaccine. I know what I administer through our, our flu vaccine clinics here at Diamonds, but folks have other avenues and places where they can get the flu vaccine. So I try to get a more overall number. And if they haven't gotten it, I have, you know, I ask for reasons why. And one of the main reasons is just what I discussed, vaccine and ineffectiveness. Mm -hmm. They're saying that vac the vaccine may not have been effective the year before, maybe the year before that. So they're thinking, well, if it's, it wasn't effective last year, why should I bother? Uh, some just don't like needles. They have a fear of needles mm -hmm. and they, they, they just don't want to. Others just don't think they're ever going to get the flu. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a young, healthy person. I don't think I'm going to get the flu. I don't think I need the flu vaccine. Uh, there still is a small component of individuals out there that think that if they get the flu vaccine, they're going to get the flu. Right. Uh, they don't realize that prior to getting a flu vaccine, they have already been exposed to someone who has had the flu and they may just be in their incubation period prior to getting the symptoms and they get the flu vaccine and lo and behold, they're in the incubation period and then all of a sudden they get the symptoms and they equate that to getting the flu vaccine. Some uh, out of the more outlandish ones that I've received in the survey have been like, I just simply don't have the time. Mm. It doesn't take that long to get a flu vaccine, uh, or I forgot. Sure. And, uh, you know, uh, the biggest one has been just the ineffectiveness of the vaccines in the past. That's a good place to jump off for a second. So that that's a good question that anyone would have if, if they're looking at it and they, they see data and like, well, wasn't that effective anyway? And that's just their knee-jerk reaction. But what... If I'm talking to a healthcare pro like you, how do you counter that, that this, the perception of ineffectiveness? Well, I counter it with the fact that even if the vaccine does miss the mark with the strains that are out there for any particular flu vaccine season, that even getting that flu vaccine will help to not only lessen the symptoms that you have. So it'll decrease the severity, mm -hmm. but it's also going to decrease the length of time that you are sick. 
So even if you do pick up a strain that's not in the flu vaccine, it's going to help you to not be as sick right? as if you didn't get that flu vaccine. And is that really the big takeaway with flu vaccines in general? It's not, it's not, um, it should never be the assumption that, oh, it will outright prevent it and I'll never get it once I get a, get a shot. It's always just to adjust your expectations and think, well, if I do get it, even if I'm vaccinated, I'm going to recover faster and I'm going to feel better ultimately. I, I think that that is something that should be put out there a little bit more uh, for people to understand because I think oftentimes when we think of the term vaccine, we think, okay, if I get the flu vaccine, I'll never get the flu. But, you know, these are not 100%, mm-hmm. but they do protect you. You know, right. it's just the same if you take a child to the pediatrician and you get the measles vaccine. Mm-hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that child is never, ever going to not get the measles. It mm-hmm. just helps them and protects them from maybe not getting the measles. Or if they do get the measles, it's not going to be as severe. Right. Uh- Switching over a second to COVID vaccination, um, as we've said, there's a big emphasis still on COVID vaccination right now. We're still technically in a pandemic. Um, But of course, right now, there's all these new boosters out there, which you've been administering as part of your daily work. Is there any harm uh, in getting a COVID vaccine or booster at the same time as a flu vaccine? There is no harm. Um, There's been a lot of research on that, and of course the FDA and the CDC also have been looking into this, and you can administer both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, some people prefer to have it administered in separate arms. Mm -hmm. Uh, If they don't prefer, or if they have a contraindication in having it in separate arms, you can give both in the same arm at the same time, as long as you are picking sites that are one inch apart from each other. Now, when you think about giving the two together, though, uh, both are going to cause some fatigue. Obviously, some of, they may cause some mild body aches and discomforts, and they may cause your arm to be sore. So when you're giving more than one intramuscular injection, it could potentiate the effect. So you could have an enhanced fatigue response, for example, because you're getting the two injections together. But they do recommend that you don't wait. For example, say it's time for your um, flu vaccine, Mm -hmm. okay? If it's time for your flu vaccine and your COVID vaccine, go ahead and get them together. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if it's time for your flu vaccine uh, or or go ahead and get the the COVID vaccine. So you can get them together. Some people prefer not to just because of the side effects, though. Sure. Uh, That um, double response, if you will. Um, Something I wanted to follow back um, that you said earlier. So did if, and correct me if I'm wrong, did you say if you get a flu vaccine that may give some protection from COVID? That is the, that, that is the newest research out mm-hmm. there is that there may be some mild protection. I mean, obviously, they're both viruses. Sure. So getting the flu vaccine may give you some mild protection towards COVID as well. But um, they're still recommending that you get the two initial COVID vaccines and you follow up with the boosters. But as I had uh, discussed earlier in this podcast, we are seeing that over time, the numbers have decreased. Uh, And as you're getting to another level of booster, we're seeing the numbers go down even more. Even though, you know, I am out as well as a lot of our immunizing nurses and pharmacists in the Diamond Organization are out, we're primarily doing, you know, these boosters in skilled nursing facilities and Mm -hmm. personal care homes. In the general public, you're not seeing the numbers as great. Uh, You're seeing it more in the long-term care facilities. Debbie, as we record this, we're in the ideal window of time to get a flu shot. Um, Many sources I've read say right before Halloween, and here it is, uh, October 26th. If you had to pick only one reason to persuade anyone ages six months and older who hasn't gotten their flu shot to go out and get it right after they hear this, what would that one reason be? 
I think the one reason would be to go get your flu shot and be protected, protect yourself from the flu. Um, it's the best, it's the easiest way to protect yourself from the flu. It's the best and easiest way to protect yourself from complications related to the flu. Uh, the flu is out there. It can cause severe cases. It can cause death. And something as simplistic as a flu vaccine, which is normally in, covered by any insurance that is out there, it takes just a very brief period of time to go get one. Protect yourself. Uh, I'm already you're already hearing the stories uh, in the media about people this season getting the flu and how severe a uh, case of flu symptoms individuals are experiencing. So, and this is November, this is only October. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually we don't see peak flu activity till January and February. And the ideal time to get a flu vaccine is right now. Right now is the time and you can get that anywhere. You can go to any regular pharmacy, you can go to any supermarket-based pharmacy, you can go to your own care provider's office. They're out there and they are available. And they're, they are the best way to protect yourself from the flu, from the complications of the flu, or ultimately death. Debbie, I want to thank you once again for being on Podcast Rx and sharing your experience and your expertise with us. And certainly, uh, I've gotten my flu shot just for the record just a few weeks ago. So I feel good about that. Excellent. Um, and yes, but if you haven't, certainly do. Debbie, thank you again so much for being on with us and hope to have you back on again very soon. You're welcome, Adam. And thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. This podcast features conversations with healthcare professionals. Their statements and opinions discussed herein are for informational purposes only. This podcast should not be considered professional medical advice and should not be used as a substitute for the advice of an appropriately qualified and licensed healthcare professional. Therefore, listeners must not rely on the statements made herein. Podcast RX is a production of Diamond Pharmacy Services, the nation's largest correctional pharmacy provider. Catch our new episodes on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate the show and leave us a review. And if you have a topic you'd like to hear about on the show, or you'd like to share your thoughts on an episode, you can email us at podcastrx at diamondpharmacy.com.